Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we're based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 3rd to the 9th of March. I'm Features Editor Ezzie Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzie. How are you? I'm good. I'm looking forward to finding out what we've got to look forward to in this week's Night Sky. Excellent. Okay, well, March is not going to disappoint. There's a really exciting month ahead. We've got two eclipses this month one of which is a total eclipse and happens next week. And I should mention it's a lunar eclipse, not a solar eclipse. And we also have a partial lunar eclipse later on in the month. We also have Mars and the moon pairing up in the early morning sky. We've got some planetary shadow transits to look out for. And elusive Mercury isn't quite so elusive this week. In fact, it's the best time to see it, but you're also going to have to make the most of it this week. So lots of to talk about Mm, so please do let us know where should we start this week okay well i always start with the moon we get the moon out the way first so yep the moon is waxing all week and this week i'm just going to mention a few planets and objects as the moon is pairing up with a few of them so i've kind of got them together so on the 5th of march we have a close approach of the moon and m45 the pleiades or seven sisters star cluster It's a lovely opportunity for observing and taking some photographs. And the moon's going to be 40% lit at this time. And it's located just above the Pleiades. So both should become visible after 6.30pm and set at 1.15am. So plenty of time to get outside and, and take this in. And yeah, of course, you know, you'll be able to see the pair with your naked eye. You don't need any specialist equipment to have a look at them. One thing I wasn't quite so sure of, though, Ezzy, I don't know if you've got an opinion. If the moon is 40% lit, do you think it will slightly wash out the Pleiades? Or I was just thinking that as well. Um, I was actually, because the Pleiades is a fantastic astrophotography target, you can see some of the nebulosity with the naked eye, but if you take a picture of it, there's some absolutely beautiful pictures of these sort of like blue wispy gases between all of the different stars. And even though it's called the Seven Sisters, there's actually lots, lots more stars in there. Uh, it's just seven is the one that most people can see. I think some people can get up to 11 with the naked eye. <laughs> but very dark sky sight, very good eyesight. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not really sure if the proximity of the two, you know, the moon is it's nearly half lit, so... It'll be obvious, though, I think. I think, you know, you'll be able to see the Pleiades. Yeah. Just using your averted vision there. Yeah. The moon will help lead you to the right place. That's very true, yes. (laughs) Very positive spin there. As usual, you can use the moon to work out whether they are tonight. You can have a look, and if they do look a bit washed out, then come back again in a couple of nights when the moon's moved out of the way to a different part of the sky, and hopefully you should be able to see them a lot better. Also, you know, as I said, you can try taking some astrophotos of it. We have guides on how to do that kind of thing. And one of the great things about photography is if you can do different exposure lengths. You can do some which really bring out that nebulosity and the dim lights of the Pleiades, and then you do a shorter exposure which brings out the moon's details, and then you can put them two together in what's called a composite photo. So we have guides on how to do that sort of thing on our website. I will put a link in the show notes below if people want to find out how to do that. Excellent. Thank you. Hopefully we'll get some good photographs sent in. I do always love when we get ones of the Pleiades. It's just such a beautiful thing. Yeah, they're stunning, isn't it? They just look so dazzling, even in the photograph. They're just like diamonds, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So on the 6th of March, after midnight and throughout the early hours, look out for the 42% lit moon and Jupiter located closely together in the sky as they make their way down towards the northwestern horizon. Don't mistake orange star Aldebaran and Taurus, which is below Jupiter for Mars. It, it's not. <laughs> so don't think you're seeing two planets there. And if you're not one for staying up late, then you can still catch Jupiter and the moon close together in the evening sky on the 6th after darkness falls. And we still have the Pleiades still close by and Uranus is low on the horizon. So a lot happening on the 6th around the moon. Mm. 
And on the 8th, we have the jeweled handle Claire Obscure Effect on show, not tonight, but this afternoon at 2 p.m. I, I've never actually thought to look for a Claire Obscure Effect in the daytime. I always just kind of do it at night. And it kind of just occurred to me when I was looking this up, I thought, yeah, why? You know, I've got a really good view of the moon from the back garden. I see it in the day when it's out in the day. And I never, ever think to just get my telescope out and have a look. And like I said, especially for Claire Obscure Effects, because I just, you just kind of always think, oh, well, no, it's a nighttime thing. Because you can see the moon during the day. That's one of those questions that is one of the most popular pages on our website. Can you see the moon during the day? Yes. Not all the time, but sometimes. But when it is up and about, it's not just this sort of random white thing. You can see the various different mare, the dark patches and things on it. So I don't see why you couldn't be able to see a clear obscure effect. Be an interesting thing to see because it would be a bit more washed out than you'd normally be used to. Definitely. I think it would be quite challenging to see it in the daytime rather than the night. Yeah, I don't think it would be as dazzling as it would be at night time. But yeah, you're right. Sometimes you know, if you look up to the moon in the daytime sky, you can make out the dark patches of the Mari, can't you? But, you know, clear obscure effects are just that interplay of light and shadow, aren't they? So... Yeah, I think I think this is going to be one for my diary. I'm going to give it a go. So if if you want to see this, then the 70% lit waxing gibbous moon will be visible high in the afternoon sky. You need to locate the Jura Mountains that border Sinus Iridum, the Bay of Rainbows. And this is a semicircular bay located on the northwest region of the moon. They're going to look illuminated and this is going to create the jeweled handle effect. So obviously not see it with your naked eye but you will need a pair of binoculars or a telescope to, to see this lovely effect. And on the 9th of March, we do have a conjunction of Moon and the Mars, but I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Moving on to the solar system now. On the 4th of March, Mercury reaches its closest point to the Sun, also known as perihelion, where it's going to be a distance of 0.31 astronomical units away from the Sun, and Mercury is going to be visible this evening, approximately 11 degrees above the western horizon from around 10 past six and sets around 20 past eight. So plenty of time to catch it. So one AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So 0.3 AU is about a third of that distance, which is, you know, where Mercury tends to orbit around the Sun is about one third that distance out. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Mercury, again, you know, we spoke about it last week and it's kind of one of the top planets, I'd say, of, of the month to get out and try and spot. And I just feel there's, there's plenty of opportunities. If you've missed it one day, then, you know, it's going to be there the following day to, to have a go at. So little Mercury in the limelight. <laughs> also on the 4th, if you enjoy watching shadow transits of Jupiter's moons, then you are in for a treat tonight when two of its moons, Ganymede and Europa, cross the gas giant. Lasting for around two and a half hours, the shadow transits kick off from 11.36pm and draw to a close in the early hours at 2.12am. And of course, you are going to need a telescope to see this event. On the 5th of March, Venus still shining brightly at magnitude minus 4.3 in the west. And on the 5th, it will be in its 10% phase. So it's going to appear as a very thin crescent through the telescope. And at 6.30 p.m., Venus will be 20 degrees above the western horizon and Mercury can be located around 10 degrees below Venus. And if you're planning on viewing the Moon and Jupiter from midnight onwards into the 6th, then why not get your observing started early? So on the 5th at 7.57 p.m., Callisto, one of Jupiter's moons, will appear very close to the northern limb of the planet. So yeah, you could see this through a small telescope. On the 7th of March, Mercury is in its half phase or is at dichotomy. In other words, it's 50% lit. And on the 7th, it will be shining quite brightly at a magnitude of minus 0.5. It's going to be quite high. Well, higher than it was the <laughs> days before. <laughs> Mercury never gets especially high. No, we're not talking like 60 degrees here. It's going to be 13 degrees above the western horizon and visible from sunset until just after 7.50 p.m. So with smaller telescopes, you will be able to appreciate Mercury's phases. And tonight or, or this evening, that's going to be a good opportunity to see Mercury half lit. And 
back in January and lugged my Dobsonian outside. And I say lug because Dobsonians are quite hard to move mm-hmm. in the end of terrace house as well. It is so. one of the things you pay. So Dobsonians are those big ones. It's, it's a very sort of solid base. It means you can get a lot of tube. You can get a lot of lens effectively mirror for your buck but you pay for it with some more practical considerations of being able to move it around that's it it can be quite awkward because i don't dismantle it when i'm moving it around because it's just it's just in the house so trying to get the right technique to kind of pick it up and move it without hurting your back or whatever but i do prefer the dobsonian design it's one of my favorite compared to a tripod really really simple so yes, they definitely I, I did lug it. Feel more solid, you know. They do, yes. You're not worried about that going anywhere. No, <laughs> even when you want it to. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing I like is it hasn't got the counterweights mm. on it as well. It's just so easy to use. But yes, the the one downside is woman in her forties <laughs> trying not to hurt her back by getting outside. But yes, that is one of the great things about telescopes <laughs> is there's so many different varieties that. For me, I like refractor telescopes because you just point them and go. You don't have to worry about collimation. They're just very easy and simple and straightforward. But for other people like you, a Dobbsonian's better. And then for other people, something like a a schmidt cassegrain or something like that. There's there's lots of different options and you just find what works best for you. Yeah. Well, I did buy something from a DIY shop. You know, you move the plant pots around on with the wheels. Oh, yeah. I know the type. Yeah. Yeah, so I did actually buy one of those to just move the Dobsonian through the house. And then I read somewhere online that, you know, perhaps that wasn't the best of ideas because obviously the vibrations could do something to the mirrors. So although I've had no problems with it yet and I wouldn't use it outside, but just to get it through the kitchen or whatever on the land. One of those things you just have to keep an eye and make sure that everything's collimated where it should be. That's it, yeah. So it's, it's not something I'd want to try and fix myself. So anyway, yeah, back in January, took my Dobsonian outside and I observed Venus at dichotomy. So yeah, it was, it was really good to see that. But one thing to be careful of, if you are going to look at Mercury through your telescope, obviously, as we have mentioned, it's close to the sun. Don't try and look at Mercury if the sun is nearby. Yeah. Make sure that the sun has fully set. It's a lot easier to be safer when observing Mercury and Venus when they're in the evening sky, because once the sun's gone set, you don't have to worry about when it's going to come back up again because it's not for several hours. But do make sure that it has fully set, that you're not pointing any optics at that could potentially observe the sun because you can quite seriously damage your eyes and your equipment. I will let you decide which one's more important. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Probably the telescope for some people. (laughs) For some people. Well, if if you haven't got your eyes, you can't use your telescope, so. This is very true, yeah. Yes, everyone just be careful. (laughs) So the 8th of March is the best day to see Mercury. Mercury reaches its highest altitude of 15 degrees in the evening sky above the western horizon again. The altitude is going to vary slightly depending on your location in the UK. And yeah, the tiny planet also reaches eastern elongation today when it's at its furthest distance from the sun in the evening sky, which in Mercury's case, you know, it's just going to be over 18 degrees. So today or tonight really is is the best time to view it it's going to be visible 30 minutes after sunset and it's going to set around five to eight so make the most of observing mercury this week because by the end of the month it's no longer going to be visible in the evening sky so now we just need some clear skies as to make the most of it <laughs> on the 9th of march we have a gorgeous sight to see in the west in the early morning of the 9th so mars and the 74% lit waxing gibbous moon are going to be very close together in the constellation of Gemini. I'd suggest, you know, stepping outside after midnight to watch them gradually move closer over the following hours. And this is a photo opportunity for sure. So Mars is going to be at a magnitude of around minus one and Gemini is going to be shining above them. So, yeah, it'll be nice. That's a nice bright planet. That's very obvious and easy to see. Yes. And again, you know, hopefully it won't be washed out too much by the moon because, as I mentioned, it's going to be 74% lit. But yeah, you'll still see them. You'll still see Mars, you know. And the rest of the week, 
Neptune and Saturn not visible in March. Jupiter, you know, it's still prominent, but by the end of the week sets just before 2 a.m. And Uranus will be setting much earlier, not long after midnight. So yeah, Uranus, try and catch that as well before it starts setting really early. Well, it sounds like there's another packed week to look forward to. Thank you very much for taking us through all of that, Katrin. If our listeners at home would like to stay up to date with even more stargazing highlights, do subscribe to the podcast and we'll be back here next week. But to summarise this week again, we start on the 4th of March, where Mercury is at its closest point to the sun, perihelion. Ganymede and Europa will also be crossing Jupiter, creating shadow transits. On the 5th, there's a close approach of the Moon to M45, the Pleiades star cluster. It's a good naked eye target and a great photo opportunity. Venus is also in its 10% lit phase, and Callisto, one of Jupiter's moons, will appear very close to Jupiter's northern limb. On the 7th, we've got Mercury at Dichotomy, when it'll appear half lit. In the early hours of the 6th, you can see the 42% lit moon and Jupiter located closely in the sky as they make their way down the northwest horizon. There'll also be an opportunity to see that again when the evening rolls around. On the 8th, the jeweled handle Claire Obscure effect will be visible during the daytime, and it's the best day to see Mercury in the month of March. And finally, we finish the week on the 9th, where there is going to be a conjunction of the Moon and Mars. So lots of great sights to see there, and hopefully you'll be able to catch some of them, and we'll see you back here next week for even more stargazing tips. From all of us at Star Diary, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Mm-hmm.